In this part of the notebook, we walk through how to use the Ridge regression classes in Scikit-Learn. So I'll import the Ridge class uh, from the linear model module. The Ridge class implements the Ridge regression uh, loss function that we described earlier. In fact, if we look at the documentation on this, so using the, the question mark at the end of our function, uh, Jupyter Notebooks will show us the documentation. One of the neat things about this documentation, it has the loss that we described in lecture and we actually work through above. However, there is one small difference. You'll notice that we don't have the one over n. So this isn't the average loss, but the total loss on all of the data points. And this means that the regularization parameter alpha will have to scale with the size of our data and the number of dimensions in our model. So I'll press escape to get rid of this. So that is the, the ridge uh, module. Uh, so I import it again. Uh, we actually don't need this, we'll get rid of it. Now we'll insert the ridge class in our prediction pipeline from before. Recall that we've defined the select columns, which is going to pull out the appropriate quantitative feature columns. Then we have the origin encoder, which will construct a one-hot encoding of the uh, region of origin for that vehicle. And then the text encoder, which constructs a bag of words encoding for the name of that vehicle. We are using the simple imputer to uh, impute missing values in the data. The simple imputer is using the mean of each column as the value that will be filled in when there is a missing value in that column. Finally, our linear model is no longer the linear regression class, but the ridge class that we just imported earlier. We will set the regularization hyperparameter alpha to 0.5 initially. In the next part of this notebook, we'll actually walk through the process of cross-validating uh, to determine the best value of alpha, but we'll start with 0.5. So we first run this. We can then fit the model to our training data, and we will save a copy of that model in our dictionary of models with, al with the alpha value equals to 0.5. And this will allow us to now compare that ridge regression model with the other models that we defined earlier. So a quick recap, we've been looking at this, this plot through each of the earlier stages of this notebook, moving from left to right, we're adding more and more quantitative features. The blue column corresponds to the training root mean squared error. The red column is the cross-validation estimate of the root mean squared error. And the hard to see uh, teal column is the test error that we shouldn't be plotting, but we're plotting anyways to see how the test error relates to the training and cross-validation errors. But again, if you make a decision based on this, this teal column, that will actually invalidate the use of the test data for future testing. Now, uh, if we look at the very far right of this plot, this is the model where we combined all the quantitative features, the region of origin of the vehicle, and the name of the vehicle. And we encountered this problem where our training error dropped dramatically. So there was a, according to our training loss, this was a big improvement, but the validation error actually went up, as did the test error that we're not going to look at. But the validation error did in fact go up, which would indicate that we had overfit. Now, by taking that exact, exact same model setup, the same set of features, and then introducing the ridge regression penalty, so it, introducing this additional uh, squared penalty on each of the coefficients or parameters in our model, uh, we were able to address the overfitting. And in fact, we sort of went the wrong direction. We ended up underfitting again. So our training error went up quite a bit. Our validation error also went up. So we actually made the model even worse by adding this regularization term. Now, there are many explanations for why we might have seen the ridge regression model perform worse than our original overfitting model. Uh, the more obvious or standard reason would typically be because we need to adjust the regularization parameter. But we actually forgot an important step in the design of that pipeline. We forgot to normalize our features. So now let's go through the process of normalizing features. Now I say normalize, but I really should say standardize. Uh, normalize would imply actually constraining the rows of the feature matrix to have unit norm. Now this is something you might also do to control the magnitudes of the features. In fact, it's built into some of the regression packages. Uh, but in this class, we're gonna focus on standardizing our features uh, because one, this is something we've covered already in the past. And this is a pretty standard technique, pardon the pun, for 
ensuring that our features have all roughly the same order of magnitude. So let's fix the notebook. So we say standardize. All right, so to standardize the features, we're going to use the standard scalar uh, transformation. But actually, before we do that, I want to look at briefly why the ridge regression model might have performed so poorly w without standardization. So let's look at our training data. So we look at our training data, we notice that our quantitative columns have a pretty wide range of magnitudes from four, eight cylinders to displacements on the order of hundreds to things like weight on the order of thousands. And then we have columns like the origin that would be one hot encoded having values between zero and one. And likewise, our, our name column is going to be bag of word encoded. And again, we'll have uh, values on the orders of zero and one. So we have a pretty wide discrepancy in the values that we, uh, in our feature matrix, which means that applying a single regularization parameter to all of these different magnitude features uh, will create a problem. Uh, for example, a very small parameter attached to a very large thing like the weight of a vehicle uh, could have a, a big impact in miles per gallon without paying much in terms of the regularization penalty while maybe a really important thing like the number of cylinders might actually need a fairly large parameter to have an impact on the miles per gallon. So maybe eight cylinders uh, times, or let's say four cylinders um, times five uh, would be a good coefficient to estimate miles per gallon perhaps. Uh, and that's a much larger than the, uh, maybe if I was going to wait to miles per gallon, this would be some small fraction, All right? So, uh, the, the features have pretty wide discrepancy in, in their magnitudes, and so we want to standardize these features. So to do that, we'll use the standard scalar class from scikit-learn. And the standard scalar class will take the mean of each column, subtract off the mean, and then divide by the standard deviation. Now, in our pipeline, it might be most natural to apply the standard scalar at the very end of the pipeline. Unfortunately, if we just try to apply it directly, we'll actually run into a problem because the count vectorizer outputs a sparse matrix. So the matrix that's coming into this stage of the pipeline is actually a, a large sparse matrix. And because it's a large sparse matrix, the standard scalar is actually going to raise an error because subtracting the mean from all of the zero entries in the matrix will make them non-zero, transforming a sparse matrix to a dense matrix. Now we can suppress this error by setting the with mean flag to false, which will avoid subtracting the mean. This would probably still work as a standardization method, uh, but we can actually bypass this altogether by realizing that the count vectorizer and the one hot encoder are all gonna have features in the order of zero to one anyways. So it's not quite as critical that we rescale those. Uh, in contrast, the quantitative features uh, do need rescaling. And so we can apply the standard scalar transformation just to those features directly. So we put the standard scalar operator the standard scalar class here, uh, instead of what was previously here, the pass through uh, string, which was just passing the values as they are onto the next stage in the pipeline. So we'll comment this out and go ahead and run this. And now we can train this model with the scanner, standard scalar transformation. We're gonna call this ridge N for ridge normalized, though it probably should have been called ridge S for ridge standardized, but uh, we'll, we'll stick with n so that the notebook doesn't uh, change too dramatically. We can fit this and we can examine what the uh, resulting model looks like. All right, so we've already made a lot of progress. We've chosen alpha of 0 0.5, which was just a guess. And then uh, by appropriately standardizing our features, we're able to get a a training error, which is low, but more importantly, a cross-validation error, which is lower than any of the earlier cross-validation errors uh, before. And this is using the model with a large number of features. And just uh, to recall the number of features, in the earlier video, we actually uh, computed the number of features. And so this model has 270 features that we're using. Uh, so it's a lot of features given our training data set has how many entries? Let's go take a look. Uh, we lost it here. So if we look at our training data, uh, 270 features, 298 rows. So that, that is a lot of features for the amount of training data that we have. So using regularization, we're able to make use of that large number of features without overfitting.
All right, now what about different alpha values? So one thing we could try is just a different alpha value in our earlier setup. So here, uh, we don't need this extra line. Uh, we set alpha instead of 0 0.5, we'll try a much larger alpha of 10. So let's do that. Again, we'll, we'll train and, and compare this model. So now we've added the alpha of 10. That uh, did as we might have expected. So increasing the alpha value caused our training error to go up. It also caused our validation error to go up slightly, which would suggest that the model was starting to underfit as we increased the, the alpha value. So we had an opportunity to make the model a little more complex, make the alpha value a bit smaller, uh, move in the direction of overfitting to get better accuracy. And in fact, that's what we saw here. Now, something you should never do, but let's go ahead and do anyways, we can look at the test error too. It's interesting to note that the test error did appear to actually go down by making the alpha larger. This could be just coincidence. We shouldn't, again, make the design decision to choose the larger alpha because our test error went down, because we shouldn't be making design decisions based on the test error. The only use of the test error is that once we've done making these design decisions to actually look at how our final model performs. So based on validation error, we would say that uh, probably the smaller alpha is better. It's also worth knowing that cross-validation, because it does repeated resampling, the estimate of the, the error is actually pretty robust. And so I might actually trust in the design process this validation error more than I would the, the hard to see teal bar, the test error. All right, so now let's explore how we can use cross-validation to find the optimal value for our regularization hyperparameter. So here's how we'll do that. So I'm going to implement the cross-validation search procedure for the optimal value of alpha. Uh, I will do that by first defining a pipeline. So here's my pipeline. I've set the initial value of alpha to 10, uh, though we'll replace this value immediately when we start to use this pipeline. I'm going to try a range of different alpha values between 0 0.5 and 20. You might play with these values based on how the curves look, and I'll talk about that after we've looked at the regularization plot. I'm going to keep track of the cross-validation error, the training error, and again, the test error. You shouldn't keep track of the test error. You shouldn't even be looking at the test error at this point, but I want to show you how the test error looks when you, when you compare it to something like cross-validation and training. So we're gonna loop through each of these alpha values in this loop here. The very first thing we're gonna do is update the alpha parameter of our ridge regression model and in particular, we're going to do that by updating the, the final stage of that pipeline, because our ridge model is a pipeline of multiple stages. The setparams function on scikit-learn models has a neat property where you can pass in the name of the stage of the pipeline, in case, this case, the linear model, followed by a pair of underscores, and then a parameter for that particular model that you want to update. Uh, this is actually equivalent to doing something like ridge model. linear model set params alpha equals alpha. And in fact, I think you can even do uh, alpha equals alpha. So these would all be ways to set the parameters. I'm going to demonstrate how to use a set params function and this neat feature of, uh, of constructing the path to that parameter by the, the name of the model, the stage in the pipeline, followed by the parameter for that stage. All right, so once we've set the parameter for the model, we can then call the cross-validation function in scikit-learn, which is going to take that model uh, and run five-fold cross-validation using the RMSE score function we defined earlier to evaluate the cross-validation score, uh, root mean squared error score, using the training data. And we'll take the mean of all of those, so we'll, take, we'll get five different scores, we'll take the mean of that, those scores, and append that to our list of cross-validation values. We'll then fit the model on all of the training data and look at the training error here and the test error here. So run this. So we can now plot each of these different curves. So we'll run this plot here. And what we have is the training error as we vary the value of alpha the cross-validation error as we vary the value of alpha, and the test error, which we should not look at as we vary the value of alpha. 
So first, it's it. So first, you notice that the training error increases, uh, and we expect this. So by increasing the value of alpha, we're in a sense causing the optimization problem to favor not fitting the data, but instead decreasing the magnitude of all the parameters. The cross-validation error, which is a better estimate of how the model will perform on new unseen data, uh, this initially goes down and then starts to jump back up, which suggests that the best value of the regularization parameter is a smaller value of alpha. In fact, we can zoom in on this curve here. This is what we're trying to optimize. So an alpha around 1.844 seems like a pretty good alpha for uh, this model. Right, so that would be our best alpha if we're trying to minimize the cross-validation error. Now, one thing that you might notice in this plot is that a lot of these larger alphas are probably not worth examining. So we might really want to uh, just focus our search in this space and look at a, a slightly higher resolution. So we could try to do that right now. So go back up here and say, well, really, we care about numbers between 0 0.5 and 3, and maybe we want to take 30 values in that range. And then we can run the plot again. And so now this red curve here is a little bit flatter because we're focused just on the regions where the model is a good fit potentially. So now we could focus just on the cross-validation curve. You'll notice it's a bit flatter because we're focused just on the alpha values that are likely good candidates. So we zoom in on this curve here. We start to see that it still goes down and then back up. Uh, and that the alpha value that's optimal is somewhere around 1.5, uh, maybe 1.6 in this, this ballpark here. Right, so this is our best alpha. Uh, and so we can then go back down here. If we choose the arg min of the cross-validation values and take the corresponding alpha, we selected the best alpha according to its cross-validation score. We can then set our model to use just the best alpha and then we will plot and save this model. So here is our model with the best alpha. You notice this, this now gives the lowest cross-validation error. So this is our best model up until this point. So this model achieves the best compromise between fitting the data and generalizing to new data. In practice, implementing this cross-validation search can be a little bit uh, cumbersome. You have to write a lot of code. Uh, Scikit-learn actually has a built-in ridge regression model function that automatically cross-validates itself. Uh, and th this is the ridge CV class, so we can import this. Instead of the ridge class, we import the ridge CV class. We give it the set of alphas we'd like to automatically cross-validate over uh, when defining the instance of that class. So do that here. And we're building just another pipeline with this new ridge CV class. I can then call the fit function on this model uh, and plot this as well. And we expect this will probably perform similarly to our uh, the model we just did a search over. So here's our Ridge CV class. Um, it actually got just a slightly higher uh, cross-validation error, so maybe it's not not quite as good, uh, but it's not bad. Now it's actually worth noting the cross-validation step is actually probably calling the cross-validation search for each of the different cross-validation values. So this is. Uh, you shouldn't use the Ridge CV class within a, a cross-validation loop. So this, this number might be just slightly off. Actually, let me state that one more time as it's probably a little bit confusing. Uh, notice that we're using the Ridge CV model, which is going to do cross-validation. But in order to compute this red bar, our plotting code actually calls this whole pipeline inside of a cross-validation loop, which means that in each step of the cross-validation loop, it's going to then run yet another cross-validation loop inside of that to choose the best hyperparameter for each of the cross-validation splits. And that's probably not what we want to do. So instead, what we might have wanted to do is pull out the best alpha from the ridge CV and then construct just a, a simple ridge uh, model using that alpha and then run the cross-validation. And I'd expect that to be uh, basically the same as, as this model here. All right, so that is the process of doing ridge regression using cross-validation to tune a hyperparameter the remaining video in this notebook will look at the same process, uh, focusing mostly on using the, the built-in cross-validation functions uh, in the context of Lasso, uh, and it will also examine the, the ability of Lasso to do feature selection.